uh, I'm thrilled to be here, and Barry, thank you for the introduction. I, I have to say, it was a 40-year-old's birthday party. They were not there for some six-year-old. It was a little more civilized than that. And, uh, and like Governor Dukakis, I, uh, my very career um, is um, uh, due in much part to uh, Professor Allison, who I arrived here after serving in the Clinton administration as a faculty spouse. I uh, left the Clinton administration because my husband got a teaching job up in Cambridge and, and without knowing me at all, uh, just knowing some of the work I did, uh, also opened up the Kennedy School to me and uh, let me think a little bit and, uh, and eventually uh, I was executive director of the Belfer Center uh, that, that he is director of and, uh, and has been um, a fan and a supporter ever since. In fact, I, when I left the Obama administration, wasn't quite sure what to do. Graham actually takes notes. So if you want career advice, you know, he actually will take notes about what you're doing. Um, and Governor Dukakis, I've not only been a fan from afar, but up close, I wanted to say when I um, got, I, I worked for a, a great uh, governor of Massachusetts as well, um, uh, Deval Patrick, but, and when I got the call from him, um, uh, uh, I, you know, you don't think about state government when you're sort of a national security foreign policy person, you don't sort of think, and, um, but state government had been changing in response to 9-11, and, and it was actually what you had done to state government. You really were um, influential in wanting to be, bring in all sorts of people with varied careers um, uh, to make it a, a, a strong and dynamic place, and that legacy held through. Uh, with uh, Governor Patrick's administration, so I want to thank you as well. Um, so, uh, we're supposed to talk about U.S. defense and foreign policy, and I'm going to uh, uh, be um, take on this notion of defense and foreign policy a little bit, um, and something that I have been doing, if you read my columns, which is uh, I find the dichotomy, and part of this, because I come out of the Homeland Security apparatus, really, really difficult to manage. Uh, this idea that there's this foreign thing or national security thing and, and uh, something called homeland security. And in fact, um, it had been bifurcated in the Bush administration. <coughs> Part of that is just the legacy of 9-11. Yet a separate, you know, within the national security staff, Bush had a separate homeland security advisor, a separate national, uh, homeland security staff a separate national security staff. And at, when Obama's team came in with the transition, um, which I also worked, we said you can't, this concept that over here, over there, uh, it doesn't work. And you have sort of a management problem. And that matters in government to the extent that you want things to make sense, uh, both internally and to the outside world. So one of <coughs> Obama's sort of, you know, not very public moves was to merge these two staffs and to really, um, I mean, how do you, what is counterterrorism, right? Is it intel and that stuff in, in Pakistan? Or is it uh, you know, protecting your cyber networks here in the United States? It's a, it, the, the line is not easily bifurcated. And I've been thinking a lot about that. So in terms of advice to the president, we're thinking about um, some of the challenges. Um, it, it will continue to be in this ever global world. Uh, so to speak, uh, that that bifurcation won't be able to stand. So um, Professor Allison went into the differences, if we can judge them, between um, Romney and Obama on the sort of core and, uh, you know, cat and some sometimes catastrophic foreign policy issues of our time. <coughs> and so I want to then shift that um, a little bit to some, I think, some of the themes that might that might come out. I'll tell you one thing. Um, I am pretty sure that the debate on the 22nd is going to focus on Benghazi and what happened to our ambassador. I am also sure of another thing, which is that that is so irrelevant to the dynamics that the next president is going to face. Um, and that's the that's what ha that's what happens during campaigns. But just keep that in mind with all this focus um, going on. So, in a variety of areas, um, uh, thinking about the movement of what I call the movement of people and things is a huge dynamic going on linking homeland and national security. So you think of national security and homeland there. And you see it played out in a whole bunch of different ways uh, that I have found sort of now from my perch uh, being able to write and teach um, absolutely fascinating uh, uh, in, a, in a variety of ways and makes a state like ours and a city like ours relevant to 
the, the, the dynamics that are going on in the world. Uh, the first is clearly immigration. Uh, this, we think of this as domestic, right? It's a domestic debate. It's so not a domestic debate. It is so, I mean, for one, uh, you know, we can debate sort of the contours of immigration policy and immigration enforcement, uh, all of those having fall, fall under, falling under the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, you know, Alabama and Arizona and what they're doing. And sort of the wake up calls, I'll be honest with you, those states are going through right now upon realizing uh, that being harsh to um, undocumented labor is very, very bad for your economy. Uh, so the number one, right now, if you just look at the lobbying numbers, the number one lobbying group to try to repeal some of these very draconian laws is not the typical ACLU or immigration rights, it's the American Farmers Association, because uh, they're losing billions this season. And it's one of these things that's not really thought about. And that has an impact, of course, on our, uh, our capacity to export and our capacity to import. But more importantly, obviously, uh, our, our, our fight over immigration says something to the outside world, um, our incapacity to control or to have a serious dialogue mm -hmm. about um, uh, better enfor enforcement at the border and whether it is actually bad, uh, uh, who ought to be eligible to stay in this nation and why. And what are the da dynamics of our own nation in terms of the kind of immigrant pool that we want in the future? Those are serious questions, and those are not domestic questions. They are also foreign policy questions about, uh, for example, why are we educating so many international students <coughs> and then having them sleep? Seems like a bad investment on a part, because they can't get the immigration statuses that they need. They can't get these things called the H-1B visa, which has to do with skilled labor force. That seems like a bad economic policy from the perspective of the United States. So immigration is one example in which this bifurcation doesn't work for me, and it, it doesn't, when you're in government, it actually doesn't work. Like, the, you know, when the, when the table is set, uh, and I'll explain one story um, later, when the table is set, you're getting people from HHS and DHS, but also from the Defense Department and the State Department and the National Security staff and the domestic policy staff, when you set the table about, let's say we're gonna talk about immigration reform. Another area in which I think these dynamics play out are sort of a driving force of foreign policy. And I'll, I'm gonna draw a little bit from my experience because they're recent and because it's easy to do, but um, is the, the fear, the, the notion of, when I talk about flows, right, when I, uh, uh, the flow of people and ideas, is this notion of mass migration animating foreign policy both here and abroad. Um, I believe that um, former president of France, Sarkozy, really did care about what was happening in Libya but I also believe he deeply feared uh, a massive civil war in Libya that would bring a bunch of Libyans to migrate to, uh, to France. It animates the way nations think about both their foreign and domestic policy. I will say from my experience, we care about the Haitians. We were devastated by what happened in Haiti. But what was clearly animating uh, the tremendous uh, efforts that the State Department did and the FEMA did and the Coast Guard everyone was one simple fact, was if we don't get this right immediately, if we don't get resources down there, and I know this was a debate that a lot of you saw played out on, on TV, we don't get our troops in there first, before the doctors, I know that's horrible, Before you know, because there's only one runway that was working before anyone else to stabilize and get water and food to people still alive, um, you will see Haitians get into boats and that becomes a huge domestic policy issue. Because Haitians, when they come to, on boats, only have two options, We're, they're not Cubans. Um, Cubans get automatic uh, reprieve. Uh, they are either in detention facilities in Florida, or worse, they are in detention facilities in Guantanamo Bay. Um, and that is the way it works, that's the plan. There's no other plan. To, so, so you can see how, you know, the, the, the notion that that's a foreign policy or national security issue also plays out in how we think about it domestically. And one other example, I've been writing a lot um, over the last four or five months, I've been both to the Arctic and Panama, I've had a new obsession with the oceans, but I mean, the extent to which the changes in the Arctic Sea, which you all read about, and the opening up of 
um, potential um, oil reserves for offshore drilling, although many of you saw Shell have had to abandon it now. They're going to come back next year. Um, is well, it's a domestic issue, right? Are we going to do offshore drilling off of Alaska? It's an environmental issue because there's only one reason why we can drill, which is the Arctic is melting. Uh, but it has uh, uh, huge foreign affairs, national security implications because of our reduced uh, dependency on uh, foreign oil. And it's the same with the fracking debate. That's not a, that's, you know, New, New York Governor Cuomo is, you know, starting to rethink <laughs> their commitment to fracking um, uh, uh, and natural reserves and getting um, uh, domestic sources of energy. That's going to have huge implications, you know, if each state thinks differently about it for uh, our imports of oils, which then has huge implications for, of course, our commitments and our involvements with the Middle East. So um, the same with Panama. Um, uh, uh, it's opening up, it's, it's expanding its canal. It's a really interesting time there. And that will change the dynamics for a state like ours uh, as the East Coast becomes more accessible to more commercial activity. So this, this dichotomy uh, is gonna, is, is, has never been uh, a right way to think about it, but I think since 9-11, uh, when um, the attacks actually happened here, uh, and also because of the globalization and the ability to communicate across borders and travel really fast and everything else that, that all of this sort of merges. Not to say that there's not definitive roles for DOD, DHS, State Department, HHS, whatever else. It's just the way you think about it. Um, uh, it's a lot murkier than, um, uh, than uh, and you know that intuitively, uh, than it's sometimes presented. So. Graham and I talked about a column I wrote that was just, you know, I sort of, like this notion that you're having a debate about national security only seems sort of odd, um, or foreign affairs only, and those are also domestic issues. Uh, so laying that out as sort of a theme um, and a tension, obviously, I want to move forward to um, where I think we are related to this theme in homeland security. I think it's an important aspect of foreign policy and national security. Uh, and um, I have to, you know, sort of admit, I know its reputation, I know your interaction with it, it tends to be TSA, um, uh, which we can get into. Neither, um, or not, uh, neither, um, uh, one, there's no Romney homeland security policy. Uh, I mean, just because the nature of not having significant attacks in the United States you, there's not like this group of people that are like, oh, those are the Homeland Security Advisors. He has uh, some people from the previous administration, Michael Chertoff, uh, who was the former head of the uh, Department of Homeland Security, Mike Hayden, the former head of the CIA. Uh, he has immigration uh, policies that also fall within the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and so all of those are sort of merged. So you can't really tell, like, this is, this is his policy and, and there's um, Obama's policy, right? So, but I do think something's happened in Homeland Security that, if willing, right, the next president could begin to make sense of this craziness. To its credit, the department is young; it's still young, comparatively to to a department like the Department of Defense, and it's small. It is incredibly. We think of this as this huge thing. There are about three hundred thousand uh, operational agents within the Department of Homeland Security. So. I used to always say to the other political appointees, like remember there's 100 of us and 300,000, that in the sense that you had to work with your oper what we call operational components, the Coast Guard, TSA, Border Patrol, all of these agencies that are arguably sort of protecting <coughs> the borders and the homeland. Um, and so it's relatively small compared to the Department of Defense. Um, and it has had a lot of hits and starts. It's already on its third reworking. Um, it's not that old. That's one every two years, um, two, two and a half years. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the trajectory of, oh, I, I wear a watch now, um, the trajectory of where Homeland Security has gone from 9-11 to Obama <coughs> or Romney. Um, because I think that if you can rethink this um, notion of foreign and nas uh, national and homeland security, this trajectory will, might start to make sense to you um, and might also start to uh, begin to have you think about um, homeland security and the protection of the homeland in a different way, which I think is really important for students and others interested in this um, uh, issue. 
Okay, so I have my questions too, but I don't have any cash. So, um, I have, uh, um, so my first question is, uh, are, I, I would presume, but I have to ask her, how many of you sort of keep abreast of foreign affairs, national security, what's happening in the world, the threats we face? I'm guessing most of you. Okay, so now here's a part. Um, honestly, if right now I told you, um, your cell phone's not working. Uh, you gotta figure out how you're gonna get home. Uh, the electricity is out. I'm not gonna say something bad, it's just like, I mean, it is bad, but you know, it wasn't a terrorist, maybe some crazy electrical current, whatever. And for 24 hours, you had to make do on your own. And that's also for moms and dads when figuring out where the kids are and how to, how many of you could do that for 24 hours? Okay, that's good, 48. Oh my gosh, you guys are much better. 72. Okay, so we got two days out of some of you. Um, uh, but I got about a 50% difference between those of you who sort of are aware that things happen, as we say, stuff happens, um, and your own personal responsibility, or your own engagement in it, in the American public. And I, I blame us for that. I blame those of us who um, have been in Homeland Security for that gap. Um, and want to talk a little bit about why I think that happened and where 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 this is going. So, um, so that happened, I think, probably because of 9/11 um, and a way of conceiving of 9/11 as a um, uh, as um, uh, you know, there was a lot of mantras that surrounded 9/11, uh, but the most significant one, right, with us against us, um, you know, whatever. Else. But the most, or the war on terror, for example, but the most significant one I think that sort of encapsulated where all of, what you all absorbed was this notion of never again, right? This notion that we were gonna structure a government apparatus around that not happening again. And it is a noble effort, and it is one you should demand of your government, and it is one you should criticize your government for um, uh, if they fail to do so. I am not letting government off. But it actually, I think, as I'm able to look back at it, I've been in this field since the beginning, i able to look back at it, I think it actually uh, uh, truncated and limited a really important debate that could happen about Homeland Security and, and therefore our own national security. Um, and you're starting to see that debate play out now. Um, and it's sort of exciting to be in the field because there's a lot more um, intellectual rigor behind it. Um, and uh, you're starting to see at least Obama get out a little bit more on this notion. And it's, it's the move from never again to, and I'm gonna you know, do the G-rated version, to stuff happens, right? It is this notion, or what we now call resiliency, and a lot of you have probably heard about resiliency. But it's an apparatus that was so focused, and it was bumping up against the CIA and bumping the Homeland Security apparatus up, up against DOD, so focused on, um, amongst his friends, what's essentially is a fool's errand. Not, it's not a bad errand, but it's definitely at some stage something bad's gonna happen. That, uh, that it didn't really engage the American public. And you're the homeland. I mean, this is what you know, we sort of said, oh, we've got it, or go shopping, or, you know, or as one of my colleagues who's also here, not colleagues, but uh, another Bostonian in this field, Steve Flynn, says we were good at treating the American public as, uh, as uh, terrorists or victims, but nothing else. Um, that that was a way that the apparatus engaged with all of you. And you start to see this trajectory change. Uh, for the most part, part of it is the budget. Uh, when I took over, for example, here in, in Massachusetts, uh, the state at its heyday under Romney, you can imagine, so I overtook the Romney Homeland Security apparatus. You can imagine, you think there's a difference between Ro Romney and Obama, think about Romney and Governor Patrick, um, that was at its heyday, um, uh, getting anywhere in terms of homeland security funding between, it's a lot of money for a state, 120 to 150 million dollars solely for, uh, uh, annually, solely for terrorism, which wasn't, I mean, to be honest, it wasn't happening, right? We were pretty lucky. And, uh, and then when I took over, you know, by 2006, those numbers were down to 50, I don't even know, 50, I don't even know what they are a year. And these are just, you know, these are just grants and aids to public safety entities. Um, throughout the, uh, uh, through every state. 
Um, and so there was this focus on sort of we're going to give lots of money, do lots of things, um, and uh, and sort of prevent the next attack. And, it's, and there have been attacks been prevented because of what we're doing abroad, and also who knows who we're able to keep out because of some of our rules. But um, the wake up call, I think, that this was a fool's errand is sort of a harsh way of putting it, but that that the Homeland Security apparatus had to pivot um, a little bit um, was actually, uh, 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 well, let me go into sequential order. In 2003, the department was created, 40 agencies all trying to figure out what they're doing. Uh, and that was viewed as a response, a good bureaucratic response. And then in 2005, the real moment, I think, when this nation sort of woke up to, wow, we really sort of were looking that way was, was Hurricane Katrina. Um, that changed. Uh, from a homeland security apparatus and a national security apparatus, that actually changed the way uh, government thought about its responsibility to its people, right? And that we were so focused on one threat, which was scary and bad, and lots of people are focused on it, that what we needed to do, um, uh, or what, what, how we had sort of let things go, um, became very apparent in 2005. Oh, Katrina, there's a lot of problems with, with what happened, but that is essentially what, where, we, where we were in 2005. So then you start to see changes in homeless security. They're not discussed by politicians, so I'm going to get you in, let you in on the inside street. The reason why they're not discussed by politicians is because never again has become such the mantra for the way we talk about it that for a president or a governor to say, ah, you know, we're going to do everything we can, but let's start to prepare, let's start to prepare the American public to be more resilient is a very difficult political thing to do. And we have not been able to, to get the space to allow politicians to do it. Obama mentioned resiliency on the 10th anniversary of 9-11 about a nation that uh, will suffer uh, harms, whether they're natural or man-made. Uh, but it was a sentence and a half. Um, uh, we do have within the government a resilient people thinking about resiliency, within the White House thinking about resiliency. But these are uh, uh, seeds of a dramatic change that will have to be taken up by the next president uh, or Obama in a second term, where I think Obama in a second term will have much more luxury uh, to do that. Uh, just because when you're not facing a presidential election where someone can accuse you of, you know, oh, you're getting, you know, everyone complains about TSA, and then if the second someone's going to say, hey, we have too many TSA agents, or let's stop doing this, um, you know the other side is going to attack them for being weak on terrorism or, or whatever else. So where are we now in terms of the way to think about Homeland Security and therefore to think about national security? Because I, I just, it's a, as I said before, it is, a, it is a blurry line of separation. So we used to think of Homeland Security as prevent, never again, prepare, respond, and recover. Those are the four, they make conceptual sense. That's what we do as emergency managers or operators in the field. Um, but um, we are starting to add a fifth element. This is this notion of resiliency and that it can be taught and it can be supported. Uh, this keep calm and carry on notion that we ascribe to the Brits, right? They're so good. Why are they so good? Why do they have such good, you know, stiff upper lips, right? Remember that's the, was actually taught by the British government during World War I and World War II. I'm doing some research on it. Where did this notion that uh, a, a, a city, Londoners, that were, it was gonna be bombed really much, um, not very much in World War I, and then obviously significantly in World War II. Well, there were debates within, uh, at least in World War II, within Churchill's cabinet about how to talk about this to the British government, I mean British people, and how to make them aware without scaring them, right? How to keep them in London, which was absolutely necessary uh, to keep the engines of commerce running for the, for the city and government running. You know, all of these really difficult balances uh, and what's going to be the message. And they came up with a slogan that animates all of us now, or it's just one that we all know, keep calm and carry on. But it's not genetic, right? It's not like they're born with that and we're not, right? It can be taught by our government. And I think what you're starting to see on the mayor and governor and, and a little bit on the presidential level is this um, uh, mood. I know this doesn't sound very tough, but a way of, uh, of changing the dynamics of where we put our money and what kind of planning we do. So I want to just get a little bit into that planning because moods are interesting, but they, they don't, you know, you can't measure them. 
If you look at the trajectory of money in Homeland Security from prevention to now we'll say resiliency, that, that broadband that I described, uh, you've seen a literal shift from uh, prevention and prevention only uh, between 2006 and 2007 mm -hmm. To, um, to funding not needing to go to something exclusively called terrorism, right? So in 2002 and 2003, it's all terrorism <coughs> all the time. What you've seen um, is uh, this notion of what's called um, all hazards, all crimes planning, which is we don't know if there's terrorists, and actually we won't, might not know till after. We don't know if the fire is because of an Al-Qaeda member or because of a 14-year-old kid who's, you know, goofing around, right? Or we don't know, all we know is the resources needed to protect human life and to get the city or state or wherever else back to normal are essentially the same. I would say nuclear is different. But for the most part, they're essentially the same. You get your first responders in, they do all sorts of things. So what you've seen is um, what I call the democratization of counterterrorism planning, which is it's been absorbed, as it should be, within all the other things that states and localities are doing. A police department, let me tell you, Ed Davis has had a, the, our police chief, uh, has a good friend of mine, has had a hard year, I'm not gonna say bad year, a hard year. Lots of homicides at the beginning of the year. I'm not gonna convince him, if I'm the federal government, to spend and, don't, and dedicate a whole bunch of resources to counterterrorism when he's looking at a homicide rate of two to three per weekend, right? This is not gonna happen. And so part of this is, look, the resources you need to counter terrorism, better communication, outreach to state and locals, looking at trend lines, are actually the same that you would need for normal crime. So there's been this sort of democratization of what we're doing in Homeland Security. There's also been a little bit of um, what we, what I call tough luck, which is this 72 is on you. This notion that um, for people who can't take care of themselves, shame on you for not. Um, that's the sort of message that, that for the first 72 hours, if you're able uh, to protect yourself and your kids, stay at home, whatever else, you're gonna free up limited public safety resources for the people who really need it, the infirm. Um, uh, the poor who can't get access. And, uh, and that's sort of our <coughs> obligations as citizens. So you start to see this resiliency thing. So if you look at the Homeland Security apparatus, funding has gone from mostly police departments in state and, and localities to emergency management offices, uh, citizens councils, and all sorts of other things. People, private sector, <coughs> get them thinking about cybersecurity or redundancies in their system. Get everyone thinking about, okay, we might not be able to prevent everything, but how do we get back to normal as quickly as possible, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a way of thinking about these things. Um, and maybe all of these changes, these policy changes that I'm describing in money and orientation and in the setting up of, of a resiliency office or what we call a director in the national security staff, the department embracing resiliency, I hope over time will you know, get us from never again, which I think is a difficult thing. Here's my last question. Right at this moment, how many people are flying in commercial airlines in the air at this very second? How many? 1.5 million, just this second, right? Just this second. So you think, you know, so I kind of look at that and I'm like, I can't believe there's not more plane stuff going on, right? I mean, you think that's a huge number of people up in, a, up in the air. Um, and so something will happen, uh, and it might be, and we'll do everything to stop it, but also creating a space in which politics gets out of this, and we recognize, which is a nice try, but we also recognize that, um, uh, that we have the capacity, it's not, it's not genetic, we have the capacity to bounce back and, 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 and do better. Um, and so that's sort of the trajectory of Homeland Security over these 10 years. It's truncated uh, to fill in the space. Um, and um, I think I probably went over, I'm not sure, but um, I think we're both happy to take questions. But one um, final thing I do uh, want to say is the challenge is you all, you know, this, this, some of you are domestic people, some of you are foreign people. And I think it is, um, you know, I sort of try to find that sweet spot, that sort of, you know, why is it, um, important to you as citizens of Boston or citizens of the state to be engaged is because ultimately there is that murky line that's sort of uniting all of it. I think it's 
important to conceptualize the stuff that way and therefore hopefully sort of change the way we think about never again and 9-11 and all that stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you.